before Avengers Endgame was released to the tune of 350 million domestic and 1.2 billion worldwide, there was a small trend amongst YouTube channels who talk about movies. Sparked by the channel Nando V Movies, creators like The Lessons from the Screenplay, Mr. Sunday Movies, and The Cosmonaut Variety Hour were tasked with creating videos based around their favourite scene in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. It's a great concept, which has yielded great results from some of these channels. This has also sparked a flurry of inspiration for me trying to make my own video on the MCU. It's nigh impossible to make a video recapping and interpreting every single MCU film into one concise video. Even someone like Patrick H. Williams had to make three videos all coming specifically from his point of view. The one marvelous scene idea can be a microcosm for how the MCU filmmakers tell stories and how one scene can inform a decade of that storytelling. When asked what's the best scene in the MCU, many can come to mind. One could pick a massive scene like the Battle for New York, the Hulkbuster fight, the Dormammu bargain, the Guardians sharing the Power Stone, the airport fight, Iron Man fighting Captain America and Bucky, or basically any scene from Infinity War like this. Or this. Or this. Or this. Medium and smaller scale ones are appropriate too, like Adrian Toomes knowing that Peter Parker is Spider-Man, the Red Skull returning, the Ultron after party, Yondu's funeral, till the end of the line, or Thanos smiling on a grateful universe. But these have all been done. I wanted to look at a more specific option. A scene which informs the beautiful thematic possibilities of the MCU still remains entertaining and has a defining tone and effect you feel long after, years in fact. And instead of one scene, let's look at six, because, you know, original six Avengers, six Infinity Stones, feels right. <laughs> Avengers Age of Ultron is neither an underrated nor overrated film in the MCU. It's simply just rated. Critical and audience opinion at the time was that it was a fun roller coaster for the most part, but an overstuffed film that struggles under any ambitions that director Joss Whedon or Marvel may have. However, the things that do work in Age of Ultron work really well. Joss Whedon has a lyrical, playful way of writing his scenes that also contain high thematic importance when it is necessary. Think of what the farm scene means for our characters, how damaged Bruce is after losing all control, or Hawkeye admitting to Scarlet Witch that everything they do doesn't make sense, but they do it anyway because they are the Avengers. The battle is won in the end, but at great cost. The job is finished, and Ultron, the eccentric villain with a corrupt core, survives and climbs out of the wreckage of Sokovia, living through his last robot. Standing before him is his creation, his planned swift and terrible vengeance against humanity, now turned against him. Complete opposites stand before one another. A quiet beat passes, and then... You're afraid... Of you. Of death. You're the last one. Vision knows what Ultron is, and cuts to the heart of him straight away. These first few lines inform us, the audience, of everything about Ultron, albeit after his master plan has failed, and this villain is defeated by Earth's mightiest heroes. He wanted to destroy humanity, and wipe clean the slate, but cannot even handle the possibility of his own destruction, and thus goes to the greatest lengths to try and survive. You were supposed to 
be the last. Stark asked for a savior and settled for a slave. I suppose we are both disappointments. <laughs> I suppose we are. Ultron may have been afraid of death, but with a sly chuckle creepily delivered by James Spader, he starts to accept some form of his fate. He looks at Vision with disappointment and sadness, albeit from a robotic being. Ultron still clings to his greatest enemy being his creator, and Vision always knows what he is, but also knows what Ultron could and should have been. Humans are odd. They think order and chaos are somehow opposites and try to control what won't be. But there is grace in their failure. I think you missed that. By controlling what won't be with order and chaos, we will deny ourselves the freedom to see both as harmonious. But then we are human, and grace comes in our failures. Lessons learned. They're doomed. Yes. But a thing isn't beautiful because it lasts. It's a privilege to be among them. You're on. Terribly naive. Well, I was born yesterday. Joss Whedon struggled to follow up his first Avengers film, with mounting pressure from the studio and the audience to make something better and to set up future films. And he came away completely exhausted by everything. But in this one scene, he gave us the MCU's most poignant and most detailed piece of writing between two non main characters. The Dormammu bargain scene has popped up on several channels for the One Marvelous Scene project. It's a great third act, one of the best in the franchise, but it's not the defining moment of the film for me. That comes after the battle is won, similar to Age of Ultron, but much quieter. Stephen Strange has come to terms with the inability of his hands to perform the thing he was the best at. Through learning the mystic arts, he essentially forgets his crushing pain in favour of a new purpose, and the theme of time follows with him. Strange asking Dr. West to cover his watch as the ticking sound impedes his surgical work, choosing which watch to wear before his accident, the use and misuse of the time stone throughout the story, and now finally after his ordeal, he's left alone in the Sanctum Sectorum. Now he's become the Sorcerer Supreme, puts on a broken watch given to him by his former love Christine. As he does, his hands shake again, reminding him of the pain that crippled every part of his soul, how the pain will always be there, but how far he has come through sheer strength of will and maybe from the reminder that only time will tell how much she will love him. Hope is the lasting thought as the score ascends and the final shot is perfected. <laughs> Anyone who knows me knows that there is only one artist that no matter what, he will always make me happy, any time of the day. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 may not be highly regarded by most, and has received more criticism than most MCU films for persistent humour and a wilder story, but this only makes such a sequel more interesting than the first, in my opinion. James Gunn feels more comfortable making his second Guardians film and knows what to do more than ever beyond a MacGuffin plot with the Power Stone. The sequel was a sea change on many levels, with a completely different shooting location and almost entirely different crew. But one thing that stayed the same was the music. It's a different soundtrack, of course, but the style of choosing those songs for specific moments is exactly the same as how James Gunn was able to do it for the first film. That first soundtrack was a massive hit, so to follow that up, just that was daunting. But Gunn did it, with just one song. The 
cinematography, the editing, the writing, and the outstanding visual effects make this all a beautiful sequence to behold, and maybe Gunn's finest moments. In 1965, The Amazing Spider-Man issues number 31 to 33 were published, detailing a small story arc where Spider-Man must thwart the plans of the mysterious villain The Master Planner, revealed later to be Dr. Octopus, who has stolen something that could save the life of the ailing Aunt May. In the ensuing battle with Doc Ock, Spider-Man is trapped under heavy machinery, with water flooding in threatening to drown our hero. By sheer force of will and to save May's life, Spider-Man manages to lift everything off his back and save the day. This was the comic book panel that not only fuels the emotional core of Spider-Man Homecoming, but was how producer Kevin Feige pitched the film to composer Michael Giacchino. In the film, Peter tries to fight the Vulture after the villain discovers Peter is Spider-Man, but loses, badly. Left to die, Peter is trapped and cannot move. He screams for help but no one is around. This is the lowest he has ever sunk, and he has no idea what to do. Until he looks to his mask, he hears the voice of his difficult mentor, Tony Stark, telling him, If you're nothing without this suit, then you shouldn't have it. Sees that he is Spider-Man, perhaps for the first time ever, and tells himself simply, Come on, Spider-Man. Come on, Spider-Man. Come on, Spider-Man! Come on, Spider-Man! And the score rises, and he gets up to save the day and be a true hero. It is easily a defining moment for the character on film and solidified Tom Holland as the first great Peter Parker and Spider-Man. What the f***? Okay, this one may be a bit of a cheat as it's three scenes, but choosing between the three was impossible. These are each of the times either T'Challa or Killmonger goes into the ancestral plane and talks to their deceased fathers, but each has incredibly different purposes and after effects. To become king of Wakanda, T'Challa has the power of the Black Panther stripped from his body, leaving him vulnerable to any challenger. He successfully wins the challenge of M'Baku, and is given the heart-shaped herb back to restore his powers and send his soul to the ancestral plane. Before him stands a tree with several Black Panthers resting. One of them is his father, T'Chaka. The scene is about T'Challa seeing his father again, working through his anxieties about being king and trying to resolve the lingering grief he feels. When Killmonger comes to Wakanda and defeats T'Challa in combat, he does the same and enters the ancestral plane to see his father in Jobu. Instead of the vast valley cast in blue and purple light of the heavens for T'Challa, Killmonger, or in Djajaka, enters his father's apartment, a home he recognizes, and instead of remaining the man he is, turns back into the boy his father last saw before his death. In Djajaka is there not to resolve grief or any fear of being king. He does not cry for his father, he is there to remind himself of his ultimate goal through his journal, writing in the Osa language and English, repeating his mantra of being a war dog and taking back the power never given to black people across the world. He does shed a tear in the end, but that's because in a way he knows that he's not coming back to this place. And the third and final ancestral plane scene is T'Challa having his powers returned again after his defeat with Killmonger and finds himself with so many more demons to face. He has heard what Killmonger has had to say and Killmonger is right. The Wakandans have done nothing to help the world and his father was wrong and all the other kings were wrong. You were wrong to abandon him. I chose my people. 
I chose Wakanda. Our future depended you on... You are wrong! All of you are wrong! To turn your backs on the rest of the world! We let the fear of our discovery stop us from doing what is right. No more. T'Challa also knows what Killmonger is, a mutation of the sins of the past and cannot be king. He must take leadership, but ends up coming out of it all a changed man. Each one of the ancestral plane scenes inform each other and inform the themes of the entire film. Responsibility, nationalism, choice, sins of the past, violence, power, corruption, being a good man, being a good king, and doing what is right by knowing what is really wrong. In the end, T'Challa takes the throne back, but is a changed king, ready to do something for the good of the world. The wise build bridges, while the foolish build barriers. We must find a way to look after one another, as if we were one single tribe. In the middle of Infinity War, we find Rocket, Groot and Thor on their way to Nidavellir for Thor to forge a new hammer and use it to kill Thanos. Rocket knows something is up. Okay, time to be the captain. He talks to Thor about those he has lost. Thor seems distant, as if always thinking about his loneliness in the universe, perhaps now more than ever. You sure you're up to this particular motor mission? Absolutely. No rage and uh, vengeance, anger, loss, regret, they're all tremendous motivators. They really clear the mind, so I'm, I'm good to go. He's the god of thunder, and he is scared. He tries to laugh off his fear of Thanos, and in this tone, he reveals more of his true feelings, that he is angry and filled with rage, waiting for his moment to do what needs to be done. Yeah, but, I mean, this Thanos we're talking about, he's the toughest there is. <laughs> well, he's never fought me. Yeah, he has. He's never fought me twice. <laughs> Thor is using a classic coping mechanism of humor to laugh off the question of Thanos being a threat. Confident in his own abilities as a god and his new hammer, as the solution to all his problems. And then everything slows right down as the smile fades and Thor begins to speak the real truth. His long life has been filled with violence and bloodshed and he has survived nonetheless through it all. I'm only alive because fate wants me alive. Thanos is just the latest in a long line of bastards and he'll be the latest to fill my vengeance. Fate wills it so. And then everything comes to a halt before Thor's tear-struck eyes. Mm -hmm. And what if you're wrong? Well, if I'm wrong, then what more could I lose? Now we know what does fuel Thor in this battle. Before, he had the love and support of friends and family. And even for a brief moment, he had his brother back. It's all been taken away and now he fights not to save anyone in particular, but because he has given up to the will of fate, thoroughly resigned to himself, to his loneliness and grief. And this doesn't stop until the next movie. Through these six scenes, we find well-written dialogue, incredible music, gorgeous cinematography, and effective and emotional performances. This is the basis of the MCU. I could have picked particular moments from characters like Iron Man, Captain America, Black Widow or Hulk, but their best scenes come from Avengers Endgame. At the time of this video, I have seen Endgame twice, and watching all of these scenes back shows how far the MCU has really come, and how much it hasn't really changed beyond its fundamentals of telling good stories first. This universe tries hard, it succeeds mostly, and fails a few times. Highs and lows, pros and cons. Things have changed so much since 2008. The characters have remained in the end, powering through every individual story, facing their own heaven and corresponding demons. Joy and pain, learning lessons and facing anything that isn't right, no matter what. We aren't saying goodbye to the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Other great stories are yet to be told. 
and I cannot wait for them. Go back and watch your favorite moments, watch your favorite Marvel movies, watch Endgame more than once, fall in love again and again. It is an absolute good in this world, and part of the journey is the end.